Thank you. I'm Fred Smart. I'm here with Professor James Fetzer, uh, Professor Emeritus, actually, from the University of Minnesota, former Marine Corps officer, founder of Scholars for 9-11 Truth. He's the editor of three books on the JFK assassination. We're here to memorialize a very important update on the research and observance of the 49th anniversary of the observance of the JFK assassination. We're here in Chicago trying to condense and focus this uh, next 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, we're going to get this uploaded and edited for the internet in, in advance of uh, Jim's appearance out there at the, what's it going to be, Jim? Oh, at the Roxy Theater in San Francisco, Fred. And what we're going to show Oliver Stone's film, JFK. Okay. And I'm going to comment on what he got right and what he got wrong. Judith Very Baker, who was Lee Oswald's girlfriend in New Orleans before he came to Dallas, will speak, and also St. John Hunt, the son of E. Howard Hunt, who was actually in Dallas and has confessed to his son about the involvement of the agency in the assassination of JFK. Okay, Jim, uh, the JFK is, I was five years old at the time. This is a, a, a timeless event that seems to just, it has legs. Uh, you have some important groundbreaking information right now that we want to try to focus on, uh, beginning with the Zapruder film. What about the film? You've got some updates on the Zapruder film here, just real quickly. Well, we will talk about the film, Fred, where we should begin, however. What every American needs to know is okay. that like 9-11, the assassination of JFK was a national security event that was signed off by the highest level agencies in the American government, including the Pentagon, the CIA, the National Security Council, even the Secret Service. We have more than 15 indications of Secret Service complicity in setting him up for the hit. Uh, the CIA, military, mafia, and local law enforcement took him out. The FBI was used to cover it up. J. Edgar Hoover and Lyndon Johnson were principals with financing from Texas oil men. Okay. You've got a presentation here we're going to walk through on some of the slides. Uh, we're going to try to uh, work with that. Uh, was Oswald framed? It, ap it appears like you've got some updated information here on Lee Harvey Oswald in relation to where he was at the actual time of the assassination that well, I do, Fred, but I think, you know, I better elaborate on but Americans are going to be in a state of disbelief that he was okay. set up by the Secret Service. So let me begin by returning okay. us to Dealey Plaza okay. and observing the identity of the major buildings. There's the County Record Building. There is the Dal Tex Building, of course, the Book Depository, the Grassy Knoll. And on the left, numbered four and five, those actually represent above-ground sewer openings halfway between the roadway and the top of the triple underpass. which were locations used by shooters during the assassination. As for the indications of Secret Service complicity, here is one of the agents left behind at Love Field, two of them who would have walked or run beside the president's limousine were left behind by Emily Rose. There's a video of that being told to basically get off and go away. Well, there is, and, yes, yeah, and this is yeah, a frame, that. frame from that, that video frame. Yep. Okay. Okay. They, they didn't cover the open windows. The crowd, as you can see here, was allowed to spill out into the street. In yep. fact, the 112th Military Intelligence Unit, which should have been distributed throughout the city for crowd control, yep. was ordered to stand down. They didn't weld the manhole covers. All the limousines, Fred, were in the wrong order. The presidential limousine was put right out front. It should have been in the middle, right a, flat, a flatbed truck. That should have preceded it for cameramen to film this very important political event was canceled. The, the uh, mayor and the vice president should have been early on in the motorcade because once the crowd which came to see JFK 
had seen him and Jackie, they would have walked away, not waited for the mayor and the vice president. Sure. So this was. a ridiculous arrangement and actually anyone who is familiar with security would have spotted it which is probably why Fletcher Prouty who is a national security expert was sent to the South Pole for a ceremonial event it's also the case that in this instance, the motorcade was made up of vehicles of different colors, makes, and models, so the conspirator would know precisely where everyone was located. The motorcycle escort was cut down to four and instructed not to ride ahead of the rear wheels. Two it's on each side here, right? Two on each side, okay. where one of the officers said it was the damnedest formation you'd ever seen. Because Behind the limousine? Behind the rear wheels of the limousine, because it doesn't provide any security. And that, wow. of course, was the reason, in fact, The president's military aide, who normally would have been sitting in the front seat between the driver, William Greer, and the agent in charge, Roy Kellerman, was moved to the final vehicle in the motorcade along with the president's personal physician to get him out of the way. Actually, one of the shots passed through the windshield and would have hit his military aide had he not been moved. Plus, of course, as everyone has heard, the motorcade route was changed just four days before the assassination on the 18th, where... John Con Connolly appears to have feigned a phone call to Kenny O'Donnell at the White House to get approval to change the location where JFK would speak from the Women's Forum, which was a very secure facility approved by the Secret Service, to the trademark, which was not. It had lots of balconies, entrances, and exits. It was a bad, insecure location, but they used that, Fred as a justification to, to take us turn, off. yes, to turn off to, to Main Street onto Houston and then take the 110 degree turn onto Elm, which was already a violation of Secret Service protocol, which restricts turns and motorcades to 90 degrees, but it was done here to slow down the vehicle without alarming the occupants. And then here is a very famous photograph where the shots have already been fired. He's actually already been hit in the back. He's been hit here in the throat. He's actually clutching his throat. This was taken by AP photographer James Ike Alchins and is usually referred to as the Alchins photograph. Technically, it's the Alchins 6 because there was a, were seven that he took in a series, although he, there's some dispute about whether he took the seventh of those photographs, as I will explain. Okay. We'll return to this particular photograph, which is important sure. for many reasons. Here now is frame 313 from the Zapruder film. Okay. But what most Americans don't know is that the film itself is an artifact. It was subject to revision by the Central Inter Intelligence Agency at a secret lab it had at Kodak headquarters in Rochester, New York. Okay. As Douglas Horn, in his impressive five-volume work inside the ARRB, where the ARRB is the Assassination Records Review Board, which was created by an act of Congress following the resurgence of interest in the assassination due to Oliver Stone's film, JFK. He, he, he discovered, the ARRB discovered, and Doug Horn has reported in his book, that the, the original film had actually been taken to the National Photographic Interpretation Center run by the CIA on Saturday. It was an eight millimeter film that had been developed in Dallas. They actually had to go out to get an eight millimeter projector in order to view it. Okay. But the next day, 
a person who claimed to be William Smith brought from Rochester a 16 millimeter unsplit film that had been processed in Rochester, which reflected the revisions. The film oh, that yeah. the Zapruder film used, Fred, was a 16 millimeter. You'd shoot down one side, then you'd take the film out, flip it over, shoot it up the other side so that it played the whole thing. You'd have to split the film and edit it together. Got it. But in this case, they brought the unedited film on Sunday with the revisions, whereas they brought the original film on Saturday. It's a remarkable story. Here is the film we have available to us today, which is the edited Zapruder film. The doctored film. The doctored film. Okay. And there's some indication that people, witnesses, observed the motorcade, the limousine, coming to almost a complete stop, correct? Yeah, but we want to play the film and then I'll okay. address it. Okay. okay. Notice in the film you see the back and to the left motion of JFK's body. Mm -hmm. Which is so vivid in the film, but which was not witnessed by anyone in Dealey Plaza at the time. Oddly enough, that appears to have been an artifact, a mistake in the way they processed the film. As I'm showing here, when you look at the frames, 3, 13, 14, 15, so I think, Fred, this is a case where somebody didn't get the word. Okay, it's also the case, which, which they attempted to correct, by the way, when they published the frames in the supporting volumes okay. for the Zapruder film, because they reversed the order and published 313, 315, 314, 316, which as I point yeah, out, really? wow. yeah, but that's, you know, with okay. the edited film they're still dealing sure. with, but they sure. were trying to... Sure. Now, the film you're watching is actually superior to anything most Americans has ever, have ever seen before because John P. Costello created this version. He eliminated two kinds of distortion, uh, aspect ratio and pincushion. He put the frames in the right order and restored frames that were missing from the official Zapruder film as controlled by the Sixth Floor Museum. So this enhanced version is not under the control of the sixth floor and is available to the public for no charge at all where it's archived on assassinationscience.com. Okay. you also notice that, that Clint Hill, who is a Secret Service agent who is responsible for Jackie Kennedy, rushes forward and gets on the back of the limousine. Now, actually... Picture, picture here. Yep. Clint Hill has described consistently, Fred, for nearly 50 years that he crawled on the back of the limousine, he pushed Jackie down, he lay across their bodies, he looked down at this fist-sized hole in the back of JFK's head, turned and gave his colleagues a thumbs down all before they got to the triple underpass. What you see instead is a photo here, this is Alchin 7, showing Clint on the back steps only, which is all we have in the revised version of the Zapruder film. But the reason is that much of what Clint Hill was doing was while the limousine was stationary to make sure JFK would be killed. And he, in fact, was hit twice in the head during that sequence. Once in the back of the head, he fell forward. Jackie eased him forward and was looking right in the face when he was hit in the right temple by a frangible or exploding bullet, as I shall also explain when I go through the shooting sequence. Okay. This photograph actually appears to be a fake. And, in fact, uh, Alchins couldn't recall having taken it. And it's inconsistent with not only what Clint Hill has told us about his actions, but even Roy Kellerman, during his testimony to the Warren Commission, said he had looked back when the limo was still in Dealey Plaza and seen Roy Kellerman lying across the trunk.
what he was seeing was actually Roy Kellerman lying across the back seat. But you even have Roy Kellerman confirming Clint Hill's report, where all of that was removed from the film when they revised it, because once they took out the limo stop, there just wasn't time. Okay. All right. When they got to Parkland Hospital, by the way, Fred, sure. they actually got a, an egg and got a bucket of, of water and a sponge and started to wash brains and blood out of the limousine, which is an obvious case of the destruction, yeah. destruction of evidence. And here you see the limousine before it was sent back to Ford Motor Company on Monday already, the day of the formal state funeral, where it was torn down to bare metal and completely replaced, including the windshield. Uh, we actually tracked down the official was responsible for this who confirmed that the windshield had a through and through bullet hole, which had occurred when it, he was hit in the throat as the Alchin's photograph captured. And yet, subsequently, the Secret Service would present another windshield, a third windshield, because you had the original with the bullet hole, the new one the Ford Motor Company installed, and yet a third one the Secret Service would produce that had spiderweb-like cracks. Now we're into Oswald here, a picture of Oswald. Yeah, Lee, Lee, of course, was uh, apprehended uh, remarkably fast. Uh, I mean, there are all kinds of indications that he was the patsy Fred. He, his arrest report, for example, is dated, uh, timed 140. Well, the assassination took place at 1230. And, of course, with all the chaos, can you imagine how much investigation would have taken place between 1230 and 140? And this arrest report... It was all written up at 140? ...doesn't indicate anything about suspicion. It states, this man shot and killed John F. Kennedy and also shot and killed Officer J.D. Tippett and wounded John Connolly. Now, how could they possibly... So the timestamp of 140 all 140, 140. There's the, there's the timestamp. Right there, 140. Okay. Just astounding. And it, we have more indications that Oswald was a patsy because he was given a nitrate test. In fact, he, he did not have nitrates on his cheeks, which shows he could not have filed a rifle or a carbine. Okay. He did have nitrates which on his... Which is the residue of, of a... From in, gunshot, yeah, right, yeah. from having fired a weapon. He did have nitrates on his hand, but that was doubly exculpatory because if he had washed the nitrates off his face, off his cheeks, he would also have washed it off his hands. And because he worked in a depository, books are printed in ink, and ink is loaded with nitrates. Having nitrates okay. on his hands was innocuous. Okay. Okay. There are a number of anomalies here that have been very troubling that indicate and just a photograph. <clears throat> Lee Oswald yeah. said when he was shown one of these, Fred, and there are four of them all together, different poses and stances, but they have exactly the same face. Okay. He was incriminated in the mind of the public by this very famous the photograph. The life cover photograph. The cover of life, right, where he's holding his Mannlicher Carcano in one hand. He's got the revolver with which he's alleged to have shot Officer Tippett. And he's holding two communist newspapers. Now, this was his face pasted on someone else's body. Some of the indications include the blocked chin. Oswald had a tapered chin, a narrow chin with a cleft. This is a blocked chin, not Oswald's chin. There's an insert line between the chin and the lower lip. The fingertips of his right hand are cut off. And Jack White, who was a legendary photo analyst, 
observed that since the newspapers have known dimensions, they could be used as a yardstick internal to the film to determine the height of the individual there. Lee Oswald, we know, was between 5'10 and 5'11, but using this method, the person who is standing in for him is only 5'6, wow. which means either he was too short to be Oswald or more likely when they introduced the newspapers, they introduced them a little too large. Plus, here you can see of these multiple poses, the face is precisely the same, which is an optical impossibility. If these were legitimate rather than fabricated photographs, Jim Mars and I published an article about this in Veterans Today and Elsewhere entitled Framing the Patsy, the Case of Lee Harvey Oswald, for those who want more details about how this was done. The rifle also appears to have been a plant. Here it's being taken out by a Dallas detective. But the curious thing is, a feature here is the clip. The Mandlicker Carcano Fred has the odd feature that it can only be loaded with a clip with seven rounds from beneath. And when it's loaded, the clip falls out. But at the alleged sniper's lair, there was never any talk of seven rounds. They claimed that they had found three spent shell casings, though the evidence photographs only show two, and one live cartridge in the weapon. So this existence of this clip where it should not be and which was not found at the crime scene has raised serious questions and led to the publication of an important article about the weapon entitled The Gun That Didn't Smoke. Indeed, they sought to implicate this weapon, which had an obscure caliber with the uh, anterior, what are we looking at here? anterior posterior x-ray taken at Bethesda Naval Hospital, okay. and it's front to rear x-ray, and the arrow indicates where a, a metallic slice of 6.2 caliber with a little bite out of it at 4 o'clock was found. It has to have been added to the original x-rays because the physicians didn't detect it at the time, although yeah. that was something they were looking for. And using that, of course, they sought to tie it to the weapon, and uh, where it was, you know, signed in. I mean, this is an official evidence photograph by the Dallas police. Then when the evidence was transferred to Washington, D.C., it was signed in again by the Metropolitan Police. Except, look at this, Fred. Those are not the same weapons. They couldn't even get their man with their right. Two right. Separate guns. These are two different weapons, and one was the official Dallas police uh, assassination. Those are still in the files of the Kennedy assassination as being the same, registered as the same weapons. Well, this isn't a finding that was brought to us by the Warren Commission, but you can Jeez. find the official photographs. It's you won't There's find a comparison. There. They're still in there. The official okay. photographs are there, but you won't find a comparison yeah. like that. Yeah. And here's an official evidence photograph showing they only had two, found two expanded shell casings and one live round. Here is yet another, and this is particularly interesting. Not only have the two spent shell casings on the left, but 
the handgun there. Yeah, right. and the unexpanded shell casing on the right. There's the revolver he is alleged to have used to shoot Officer Tippett. But notice that paper bag. It was claimed by the Warren Commission that Oswald brought his man liquor, Carcano, to work in this paper, paper bag. bag. Yeah. But anyone familiar with weapons know that they, you know, they're oily, and if they were assembled or disassembled, their met metallic parts are, are unforgiving. This bag would have been torn, it yeah. would have been stained, it yeah. would have been oily. They went out to uh, Ben Franklin, Fine and Dime, and got this fresh bag to pose here. Also interesting is in the center, those are some remnants of slugs from the officer Tippett shooting, which itself is very interesting. Lee Oswald, after the shooting, and we'll trace how he got there, went back to his rooming house, picked up his jacket and his revolver, and headed for the Texas Theater. Now, Fred... This is it, a picture of the neighborhood. The, Yeah, this is, this is the route. You, if you go straight up and take a right, you head over to the Texas Theater where it appears he was going to meet with a handler. To get to where Tippett was, he had to go way out of his way, many blocks. And not only is that implausible, but there were four shell casings found at the scene. They had been ejected from one or more automatics. They were of two manufacturer, a Western and Remington Rand. The officer on the scene initialed them. Later, there would be an alteration of the evidence, and now you'd have three of one make and one of the other, and now they're no longer from automatics. Remember, Oswald had a revolver. Yeah. But the revolver casings, and they no longer have the initials of the first officer. Well, a woman across the street, Aquila Clemens, explained that two men had shot Tippett, and neither of them looked like Oswald. Okay. So this was another case where they framed him using multiple forms of evidence. Now, Oswald actually had an alibi that most of us are unaware of. He actually told Will Fritz during his interrogation. that he was out with Bill Shelley in front. Bill Shelley was an assistant manager at the book depository. That led me to go back and take another look at the Alchin's photograph. Because if he said he was out in front with Bill Shelley, perhaps Alchin So it's, you know, okay, now, sorry about that. as you can see from this diagram, according to the Warren Commission, Oswald assassinated the presidents from the sixth floor window, the assassin's lair, raced across the warehouse, stashed his trusty man liquor Carcano, went down four flights of stairs to the lunchroom for what to have a Coke. He was confronted in the lunchroom within 90 seconds after the shooting by a motorcycle patrolman by the name of Marion Baker who held Oswald in his sights until Roy Truly, his supervisor, came over and assured him that this man was an employee and he belonged there. Mm -hmm. And Officer Baker even wrote in his handwritten report, which you can find published mm -hmm. in the Warren Report, the 88-page summary, of all of their findings, that he was drinking a Coke. Now, when they tried to reconstruct, they had so much trouble with the idea of him going to the Coke machine, putting in a nickel, pressing the lever to get out a bottle of Coke, that they had him strike it to make it more plausible. But none of this seems reasonable, and in fact, it's contradicted by witnesses, co-workers. At 11.50, uh, uh, William Shelley himself, I mentioned, had seen him around the lunchroom. At 
at noon, Eddie Piper, at 12.15, as late as 12.25, Carolyn Arnold, who was the executive secretary to the vice president. That's almost 40 minutes later. Saw Oswald in the lunchroom. This is right before the assassination. Remember, which will go down at 12.30. At 12.30, excuse me. Okay. So as late as 12.25, he's seen in the lunchroom. Then he's confronted in the lunchroom 90 seconds after the shooting. So, you know, how could he have possibly been on the sixth floor? And, in fact, he told, he told uh, Will Fritz, the homicide detective interrogating him, that he'd been out front with Bill Shelley. So I went back to the Alchins, yeah. and here I have circled four very important features of the Alchins. One is where you can see the bullet hole in the windshield. You can. Yeah, I'll give you a close-up sure. of that. Momentarily. Two yeah. is where there's a figure in the doorway who looks very much as though it could be Lee Oswald, although the claim has been made that it was a co-worker by the name of Billy Lovelady. Number three is a, the window to a broom closet for a uranium mining company in the Dow Tex building that was a front for the CIA. And this is a location from wow. which three shots appear to have been fired. Those shots, Fred, appear to have been the ones that were mistaken for the shots being fired from the sixth floor yeah. assassin's lair. And then finally, you can see that Lyndon Johnson's security detail is already responding, even though the official presidential Secret Service agents don't seem to have a clue. So here you can see uh, uh, even more easily where the bullet hole was in the windshield. Yep. It's in this, there's a dark hole at the center of a white spiral nebula. Yep. And indicative of the through and through hole, the president is clutching his throat. The the hole is where the his left ear would be if his left ear were would be visible. And as I've explained, when the vehicle was taken back to Ford Motor Company on Monday and completely rebuilt, and mind you, this is the destruction of a crime scene on wheels. Mm -hmm. And the directive to rebuild the vehicle had to have come from the highest levels of sure. government either Director Hoover or the President himself, sure. okay? And here's the windshield the Secret Service would subsequently produce. So Ford took it out, replaced it with a clean windshield, yeah. and yet here's a third windshield showing this spider-like or crack-like configuration from a fragment having hit from the inside. Okay. Whereas this was a bullet that was fired from the outside, went through, and there was beveling on the inside as multiple witnesses, including police officers, reported when they observed it at Parkland. Wow. Now here is the area of great interest in the, in the Alchins photograph. In the background, it's boxed in, in red. When we do a close-up, we find a, new, a number of anomalous features. Notice the man in the center, whom we'll call Doorman. It looks as though he has a towel draped over his left shoulder, except when you look more closely, you realize that's an individual who's supposed to be standing behind him who has a narrow black tie, and therefore I to see. whom we refer as black tie man. But what that means is black tie man is both in front of and behind Lee Oswald at the same time, or well, doorman at the same time, which is an obvious impossibility. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you look at this photograph, you realize, once you recognize the location of Black Tie Man, that doorman is missing his left shoulder. So that unless he had no clavicle, the major bone of your shoulder, this is an anatomically impossible feature. Okay. Also here you see, just to his left front, to our right front, a face has been obscured. When I first studied this photograph, I assumed that the face being obscured would have been Lee Oswald. 
bearing in mind that there would have been no reason in the world to alter the photograph unless someone had been there who shouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. And the person who fits that category is Leah Oswald. But it turns out, based upon our research, that actually that appears to have been Bill Shelley. I think once Lee said to Fritz that he was out front with Bill Shelley, if it turned out Bill Shelley had been out front, it would have raised too many questions. And here's another fascinating anomaly. Look down the figure of Doorman. Almost halfway down, there's the profile of a black man. Yeah, I see. Very, very peculiar. Uh, he could only be in that position if you were, say, squatting. He's looking off straight into the other side of the doorway. He's not looking at the motorcade. I mean, mm -hmm. the idea that this was a person there to observe the motorcade is ridiculous. So we only have four major indications that this photograph has been altered. Now, the question then becomes, are we talking about Billy Lovelady or Lee Oswald? That's Billy on the left, Lee on the right. And they look a lot alike. This is, is assuming that the, the, one or the other might have been in the different locations, yeah. even though we now believe this was, in fact, Bill Shelley. But I published a piece observing that it appeared that the man whose face had been obscured was Lee Oswald. And a fellow named Ralph Sinquet, who's a chiropractor, who spends a lot of time dealing with people's bodies and clothing, Notice that, in fact, the, the shirt that Doorman was wearing was very distinctive, and it was had all the features of the shirt that Lee Oswald was wearing. That same day. Yes. So, they, in fact, when he's arrested, this is one of his arrest photographs. So his point was, pay attention to the shirt rather than the face, and he turns out to have been precisely correct. In fact, we found more than 27 points of identity between Lee Oswald and Doorman. Doorman. Exactly. So his point was, pay attention to the shirt rather than the face, and he turns out to have been precisely correct. In fact, we found more than 27 points of identity between Lee Oswald and Doorman, Doorman. exactly, overwhelmingly substantiating the conclusion that Doorman, Doorman was Oswald. Moreover, they seem to have made efforts to alter the appearance of Oswald's face by imposing over his face features of Lovelady. The, a fellow named Richard Hook has proven himself to be quite brilliant and adept at the study and analysis of these photographs, Fred. It's amazing to me how good he has been in unpacking this. Most Americans have no idea that Billy Lovelady went to the FBI just within a, a couple of months of the assassination to tell them that he was actually wearing a short-sleeved, red and white, vertically striped shirt, shown here. The FBI took his photograph, sent a report to J. Edgar Hoover stating that Billy Lovelady had come in and shown them this was the shirt he was wearing and they took photographs and sent it to FBI headquarters because Hoover had asked for evidence confirming that Doorman was Lovelady. Well, the agents didn't want to disappoint Hoover, but they also only had this evidence at their disposal. So they sent it to FBI headquarters and said, this confirms that Doorman was Lovelady, when it actually contradicts it. So that what they actually did was very good. Doorman didn't have a striped shirt. No, yeah. Norman had that shirt that, that, that yeah. Lee was wearing, yeah. actually, that Judith Ray Baker had bought for him in New Orleans. It was a very richly textured, unusual shirt with very distinctive lapel, all kinds of features. It was a little tattered and torn toward the bottom, which appears to have been why they introduced the profile of the black man.
<laughs> but look at the different moves that were made, where it appears as though this person in the background here was Billy Lovelady, actually. So it was Shelley in the foreground had the face obscured, and where Black Tie Man originally appears to have been on the left, and who appears to have been Jack Ruby, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So here you got a picture of Billy. Well, you may notice the, the features in this particular photo allegedly taken by the FBI seem to me to have some subtle changes to make him look more like Oswald, just as they changed Oswald in the doorway to look more like Lovelady. Okay. So I'm telling you, Fred, I mean, the intricacy of the work of the agency in, in faking, faking, yeah, the faking evidence and covering up is simply astounding. So if we return to the Alchins again, okay. Okay, we know that there's that through and through bullet hole, and I've explained how we even found the official at Ford who replaced it, and how the Secret Service made a substitute. We've looked at number two, who was the man in the doorway. Mm -hmm. Even Oliver Stone, by the way, despite the thoroughness of his research, believed that this person was uh, Billy Lovelady. Yeah. But then Oliver, when he made his film, also believed that the Zapruder and the other home movies were authentic. So we've had the benefit of research, all of which has been conducted since his film was released, sure. Sure. with some of the most highly qualified individuals to ever study the evidence in this case.